Hey everyone, it's Christy. And it's Ezio. We're blogging for the Qualitative Election Study of Britain. And in this episode, we want to talk, catch you up, because um, we actually have done a focus group already since we've talked to you last. That's mostly because when we last reported from King's Cross, we went up and on Saturday, we just totally um, crashed. <laughs> We crashed in such a way that I can't remember what I did when I crashed. Yes. I remember not getting out of my pajamas for a whole day, which was awesome. But uh, not to moan too much. Um, but yes, we got a little bit of a recharge, and then Monday we had a focus group. That focus group had already been booked a long time ago. We f filled up our Dundee pre-election focus group with people from our independence referendum. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about what was different about the Dundee recruitment compared to, say, um, you know, Colchester and Clacton and Birmingham. Well, it was easy for one. It was probably the easiest group to fill in. Uh, we had to say no to quite a few people um, from the independence referendum focus groups. Um, so in that sense, yeah, it was very different. There was a lot of enthusiasm uh, among people, especially among those voters, because they had already experienced participating in our focus groups before and they really wanted to come back. Yeah. So one of the things that we're finding methodologically about our experience running the Qualitative Election Study Britain is that, yeah, it's actually not that difficult once you establish a, a rapport with people and they've gone through the focus group experience from an academic point of view anyway, and I don't know how it is for other focus group, like, you know, for private or commercial research or purposes, but you know, they're quite keen and they are a bit disappointed if they don't get invited back. And that was something that wasn't just our experience. We had a, a brief interaction email exchange with Suzanne Hall from Ipsos Mori that we've been sort of linking up with and we're going to be looking at qualitative electoral research both from an academic and a commercial point of view after the election. And she was saying that their respondents were also very much more engaged and had enjoyed the process a lot. So I think that's going to become part of the, the study itself is the benefits of having a personal relationship with your respondents and how that can really address issues like attrition in your panel. Yeah. yeah. And so in a sense actually interviewer effects tend to be slightly positive uh, when doing a focus group. So interviewer effects don't necessarily have to be negative all the time, which is how you understand them when you do survey research. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So in Dundee we had nine people invited but only eight turned up. Yeah. But the group uh, was, yeah. yeah. The, sorry. Yes, no, 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 you talk, you talk. <laughs> the group was brilliant because, again, these participants knew us. Um, they, some of them knew each other because they had participated in focus groups uh, before together. Um, and it was extremely lively because unlike the referendum focus groups where we kept the yes and the no voters separate, in this focus group we had a mix of four, vote, four yes voters and four no voters. Um, and again, we had a mix of uh, participants in one safe Dundee seat, so that was Dundee East, and one um, seat which was supposed to have been safe because it has always been a Labour seat. So apparently for 65 years, Dundee West had been a Labour seat, but now the SNP are polling, in the polling they are ahead. And so the Labour, the sitting Labour MP um, stood down two months before the election, and so they had to cobble together a new candidate who seems to be doing fine, but it's a disadvantage. And what it has done is it's turned the seat into an open seat. Uh, so in, in that sense, it was a good way of getting um, an open seat dynamic versus a safe seat dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I think it was, um, well, um, we, we also know and we can feel very confident that we've reached a point of theoretical saturation on some of our topics because we had brought out a blog post about the leader, the effect of the debates on leader perceptions and how people were reacting to leaders a lot of times based on their debate performances and their perceptions of how they did in the debates. Um, but our, we, it, that came out about four hours before the group and nobody in the group had seen that or read it beforehand. We don't flatter ourselves to think, you know, that, that thousands of people read our blog. So we weren't worried about contaminating our respondents. But it was the case that when we went around the room and we did the leader impressions, we got, you know, one of the persons mentioned, you know, him, uh, Nigel Farage, with a, a pint and a fag, standing outside a pub, you know, which is exactly what we put in the blog post. Or um, uh, Nicholas Sturgeon being uh, articulate 
and authentic. Actually use those, like, they, they use a lot of other words too. Um, you know, someone put compassionate and motherly and other things. But all those, you know, just sort of validated that this, these perceptions that we've been identifying all over are also mirrored in, in the Dundee focus groups as well. So in some ways it was a nice confirmation that we are on the right track and we are representing what people are saying. On the other hand, I have to say, like, we did eight, we decoded it up, but we've done eight focus groups now in the last seven days. It does get to be the case, and you have to kind of put on your game face as a moderator. When people start saying the same things you've heard five different times and still treat every person's response as if it's fresh and new, because for them, it is fresh and new. On your side, you're going, okay, let's wait, where are we gonna hear this? Who's gonna say this? Who's gonna bring this up? But that's also, again, it's sort of like um, for a qualitative researcher, when you're not getting surprises out of your data, out of the people who are responding, that means you really can have confidence that you're truly reflecting what people are thinking. Yeah. Yeah. You wanna talk about the, 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 the feistiness of the group and how we handled that? Yeah, so I mean, uh, when we were practicing the dual moderator um, format of uh, moderating a focus group, we um, did not necessarily find it uh, uh, theoretically relevant in other focus groups, and Christy has mentioned this previously, because the groups were not that divided. Uh, but we knew that the Dundee focus group was coming up and that if we wanted to try the dual moderator format there, we should get a little bit of experience and then of course we found that actually it's less tiresome, <laughs> tiring uh, to do uh, a, a focus group with two moderators. So we've kind of continued that and, and of course it paid off I think yesterday a little bit because uh, two of the participants, one yes voter, one no voter, really got at it. And they were both activists as well. Mm -hmm. So in the sense that they were campaigning for, one was campaigning for Labour and the other was campaigning for the SNP. And so then their um, ideological convictions in a sense are quite strong and they are not, uh, they don't mince words and they are not shy at expressing these conv uh, convictions. So um, yeah, so they definitely got at it right from the beginning. And both Christy and I tried to intervene at various points, Christy more than me. Um, and I think in the sense, uh, the rest of the group sort of looked at us as being right, you know, so they are trying to create a space for everyone to speak. Um, so in a way, the dual moderator thing worked because it allowed us double the power almost. Yeah, I think it would have been harder for one person to moderate that much intensity. Um, and the fact that the two of us were there, so Christy could kind of step in when I was losing control and you know, I felt that that was quite helpful. Yeah, I can kind of back her up because sometimes people um, will talk over the moderator, they'll have little side conversations, or they'll just treat you like another participant. If they want to really want to make their point, you know, um, and they want to intervene and you kind of have to step in and go, okay, you've got 30 seconds and then we have to get back on the topic. And in this case, when I said, okay, 30 seconds and then we're going to get back, he was actually on topic. So it, it ended up working out okay because I thought he was going to continue a tangent. What he did was he brought it back to the main point. So it was actually good that we didn't cut him off and gave him that space to sort of give his final point because it wasn't as contentious. Um, but yes, so that was a bit more I think, demanding. And I think should also say it was um, quite friendly. I think people around the independent stuff have had to negotiate family members who voted no and yes um, and after the group it was kind of interesting because the group finished up and people were putting on their coats and the two people who had had the earlier exchange like immediately after the group went, like they both stood up and like wanted to talk to each other yeah and I had a moment of okay the focus group is done at what point does my job as moderator end and I actually just said I'm no longer the moderator I'm just gonna let you guys have a chat and they actually they didn't fight or anything it wasn't like stomping feet nobody cried um, but they did they had a, f a free and frank exchange I think uh, for a long time <laughs> actually yeah. I think probably for half an hour they were just <laughs> going at it <laughs> yes. we packed up and we left and they were still at the door talking <laughs> So it'll be interesting in the post because they're both booked to come back. Um, so it'll be interesting again to see how they do on that. In terms of our Scottish data, one of the things that we're paying attention to both in Dundee and here and in Glasgow is the way in which people are looking at the SNP. And that was interesting from last night's groups because uh, we had, like I said, the one sort of labor person who's also um, an activist. And then we had 
an, a question about voting, um, how people, what people are thinking about when they place the mark, and what's going, or if they know how they're going to vote, what they're expressing, what values are they expressing with their vote, and I think from initial preliminary responses, we'll see how it goes tonight. What found, what I found interesting is the number of people who, you know, um, even in a situation where tactical voting will make a lot of sense, especially for no voters, people were still. Um, two respondents I think in particular were still true to their party of preferences. So rather than voting tactically, they were voting their hearts or voting what their identity was. So I'm, I'm wondering to what extent there really is going to be uh, widespread tactical voting um, for, against, I should say, the SNP here in Scotland, or people are just going to go and vote expressively and that's going to end up leading to them picking up a lot more, you know, more on the more of the sweep than the, the smaller sweep that's currently predicted. Yeah, I mean, for me, the interesting thing was also people who voted yes uh, on uh, at the independence referendum, but who are not SNP supporters, uh, and we had at least one of them in our Dundee groups and it will be interesting to see how many of those we have in our Glasgow groups because we are going to ask them the question how they voted in the um, independence referendum. But only on paper. Only on paper. Because uh, we so don't want to. Yeah, yeah, we don't want the repeat of the, actually we wouldn't mind a repeat of the Dundee group but it will just be a lot of work um, to yeah. moderate any kind of intent. Yeah, and um, go ahead, we're going to finish up. Otherwise. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so for me what's interesting is to see how people who voted yes in the independence referendum are going to vote now um, because they are not SNP partisans and they are not SNP converts if we can call them. Um, so yeah, so we had somebody who was stuck between SNP and Green and he had voted yes in the referendum and he's a Green voter. So mm -hmm. yeah, so in fact we might end up with people who are not SNP partisans voting for SNP for certain reasons, and then it would be interesting to see what those reasons are. Right, and what I can to build on that. Um, I have to remember the point I was going to make now. Ah, right. There was a I thought a very astute observation uh, for someone inside that sort of leaning SNP world and having watched and voted yes. The idea that this election isn't even a new election, and it's it's not in some ways it's it's not that it's a continuation of the referendum. But what it is is it's a continuation of the values and the views that drove the referendum. So, um, from his perspective, the way that the sort of SNP wave is really reflecting the same kinds of momentum that was driving people to vote yes in, in back in by last year. And I thought that that was a very insightful way of describing the continuation between the yes campaign and the SNP surge that we've seen in Scotland. The other um, thing that I wanted to mention that I thought was very insightful was uh, a very intense SNP activist who's participated in a lot of, uh, since the referendum. Uh, campaign or research and she talked about uh, she's a campaigner so she goes door to tour and she knows lots of people who lived in deprived areas who didn't have jobs um, who were supporting the referendum were voting yes and now she's going to go she's going back to those people saying okay well if we didn't get the referendum here's the next step right you vote SNP in this election and this is the next step to keeping you know these values going and her comment was that for these new voters, for the people who are coming out only to vote yes, you know, simple yes or no, that when you try to then bring them into the political process, they don't know anything because they weren't politically engaged before the referendum. So now, before they just had a, an easy yes, no choice, mm -hmm. right? So in or out. Mm -hmm. But now, in order to take that next step, she's saying, you know, they have to learn that how what the parties are, and how many parties there are, and what their options are, and how the system works, and she's one of those people who are is out there going up, going up to these people, going right. SNP is your candidate. Here you go. This is how you vote. This is uh, the day you vote. Um, here are the policies that you're supporting, and here are the other parties. And this is why you know SNP is better. So I mean, she's doing her pitch. She's not like doing a neutral advocacy kind of like you know um, uh, the role of a, a election commissions or something just to raise awareness. But I thought from the ground from the sort of door knocking real life experiences of people mm. that this segment of the population who was brought in 
based on the referendum, how many of them are going to be converted into more politically engaged. Now, I would imagine that there's going to be some drop-off, but if the intensity of the yes people is represented you know, um, in this person in terms of the door knocking and following up on the old yes voters and now telling them they need to go out vote S yes at S&P, then I think they should probably see a bit of a swing. You know, they'll, ki they'll pick up a percentage of people who were not previously politically engaged voted yes and have now been re-engaged by the party in order to get them to the ballot box um, on Thursday. Yeah. 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 That was Dundee. That was Dundee. Yeah. Now Glasgow. <laughs> so do you want to talk about Glasgow? Yeah. yeah. So with Glasgow recruitment, we struggled. I didn't think we would struggle because we didn't struggle in Dundee at all. Uh, but for whatever reason, probably partly possibly because we've left it a bit too late mm. uh, and didn't give ourselves enough time to recruit in the way that we wanted to. So we got about, I would say about 25 to 30 applications uh, and we were initially planning on getting, uh, on focusing on certain constituencies. So we wanted to look at Glasgow East, we wanted to look at Eastern Fruscia and we wanted to look at um, another couple of constituencies in Glasgow and in, in Renfrewshire. And of course, uh, we don't have uh, the number of participants to fill up the groups just on these constituencies. So we had to recalibrate our strategy. <laughs> yeah, which we can do in Qual. Hurrah! <laughs> yeah. Uh, and in fact, it made sense in a way because polling shows at the moment that barring, I think, four seats everything is going to be an S&P wave, so, uh, as, and especially in the Glasgow area and the Dundee area. So in that sense, uh, what is an open seat and what is a marginal seat? I mean, those, those questions actually are all up in the air. Um, and therefore we decided rather than focusing on the marginality of the seat, we would focus on partisanship and how people who are not SNP supporters or who are new SNP supporters might be thinking uh, of placing their vote. So people who are not SNP supporters, are they going to vote tactically? Are they going to vote expressively? How are they looking at the SNP wave, if we can call it a wave? Um, and um, you know what, what essentially is their thought process? Um, how are they making their decision? In terms of, say, SNP voters, especially voters who um, identify themselves as three or four on a scale of zero to six. Um, who are they? You know, where have they come from? Where? Uh, who did they vote for previously? What are their? What? What are the issues that are important to them? And why are they now kind of moving towards the SNP? So we wanted to get a, a sense of the voters in, in in terms of their partisanship rather than looking at marginality or constituency because I'm not so sure that marginality matters in Scotland in this election. Yeah, exactly. I think the models for vote choice are just going to have to take all the Scottish voters and stick them in a separate data set. <laughs> and we're going to have to run separate models uh, to try to explain the SNP's outcomes uh, because it's pretty well unprecedented as far as I can understand. And also it's just not down to the usual sorts of things that we model in political science like um, class was obviously a big one for a long time. Uh, partisan identification used to be a really great way of predicting how people are going to vote, but if people are switching their party allegiances, then you, you can't really say partisanship is driving the SNP vote because people are becoming SNP in order to vote SNP. It's, it's sort of a, you know, you can't determine the direction of causality. Economics, I don't, I mean, the economics might line up with certain SNP voters, but I don't think, but that's not the reason they're voting SNP. So, yeah, I think it's going to be kind of a wonky election for modeling in the future. But I also hope that the Qualitative Election Study of Britain will lend a lot of context to those findings and maybe provide some insights into how we can ask better questions about why people are voting for the party that they're supporting. Because currently the options on offer in the British Election Study that I'm aware of don't cover the kinds of things that we're discovering in our qualitative research. Yeah, so one other thing I wanted to mention about recruitment was this idea of shy voters. Um, we encountered this in Birmingham. For whatever reason, we really struggled in Birmingham. People were not engaging with the focus group call as much as they have engaged in any, in all the other areas. Even in Glasgow, we had more tweeting and more uh, applications than we did in Birmingham. So, uh, one, you know, what is it about voters in Birmingham that they don't necessarily want to engage in 
um, speaking about politics in a public um, arena like a focus group. Mm -hmm. Um, so Clacton that, too. Exactly. So then the second one was Clacton. And Clacton maybe one thing, one way that we could uh, explain it is, it's just really dense. Mm -hmm. uh, you have what you were calling the shy UKIPers. Mm -hmm. right, so especially male uh, men. We got nobody, absolutely nobody who yeah. wanted to say that they were supporting UKIP. Mm -hmm. um, or, or obviously or applied. Yeah, and, and there's also the way that they preface, UKIP voters preface things like they're coming out of the closet. You know, yeah. they're sort of exposing themselves as UKIP voters, yeah. which other people don't feel like they have to do. Yeah. Um, and again, in Clacton, there was the other problem of just getting voters for, you know, point blank kind of thing. So we really struggled with Clacton. And, and, and then finally, with labor voters in Glasgow, so shy labor voters in Glasgow, I mean, one of that you have already mentioned could be there are may maybe not as many Labour voters as they used to be. But even keep taking that into account, we still should have got at least one or two people applying. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we did. So um, in the future, perhaps when we look at recruitment and we have more uh, resources for recruitment, we, want, we might want to think about uh, these issues, right? So what kinds of voters might not want to talk to us? Mm -hmm and why and how can we then get them into the group. Yeah, yeah. So uh, a whole bunch of stuff, methodological, theoretical, empirical. This was a good vlog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think the next time we'll speak to you is when we have done the Glasgow focus groups. We'll have all of our pre-groups done. Yeah, I can go to sleep. We can sleep for like, no we can't because it's going to be election day. Yeah. Uh, Last thing is uh, we are starting to put out some of our findings. So, um, <laughs> yes. I'm like, and, um, it's like, I don't know, it feels like we've done 20 focus groups. I don't think we've done 20 focus groups. Just, we've done 11 and today will be 12. Two more ones, and so 13 in three weeks, yeah. Uh, we can start to say definitive things about our pre-election data set. And so you can look in the description box below. There will be a link to the blog's uh, articles. There's one that we've done on the leaders, which evaluates what people's impressions of the leaders are and why we think Nicola and Nigel did, they hit the sweet spot with voters, is what we're saying, in terms of their debate performances. And then the other thing was um, a, a blog post that's coming out on the LSE general election page that has to do with why, even though people complain and moan about debates and, and love to hate them, they, at the end of the day, they would rather have debates, televised debates, than not. And also a little bit about how we think that the debates in future could meet voter needs a bit better. And the, kind of the little hint on that is less presidentialization of British live debates and more like the hustings that people enjoy on their in their local communities. Yep, that's it. Yeah. So from me, Christy. And it's you. We'll see you guys next time for the wrap up, the big big wrap up of the pre-election focus group blogs here on the Qualitative Election Study of Britain channel for YouTube. Bye. That went well. Yeah. Hi, Christy editing. I hope you're someplace warm and cozy because right now your feet are really cold. Less cold than they were before, but still pretty cold. And take one. <laughs> take two. Take two, yes, exactly. All right, so the reason we are not in the place we were earlier is because there was just too much of chatter. Yeah. yeah. Should we start from the top? Yeah. All right. So, hold on. Make sure I don't have bogeys in my nose. I hope that gets it. I'm gonna put that video.